ride for it, I'ma organize for it Stay up in the night and in the morning, I'ma ride for it Heart for it, mind for it, ears for it, eyes for it Peace in the place on this earth for me and mine for it Work for it, ride for it, I'ma organize for it Stay up in the night and in the morning, I'ma rise for it Heart for it, mind for it, ears for it, eyes for it Peace in the place on this earth for me and mine for it Hey, peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Money Powerland Solidarity Podcast. We are here today um, in wonderful, lovely Northeast Minneapolis and really excited. When we started this podcast, of course, we were thinking a lot about politics, about gentrification, about the struggle for land and power and resources and really right here in this neighborhood. Um, but music and culture has always been a big part of our work, um, a big part of Isaac and I's life and Deanna's life and um, woven into the way we approach politics. So I'm really, really, really excited today to be joined by Jose Caban, who is an organizer and a recently Grammy-nominated musician. So I want to say welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So excited. And uh, also very excited to kind of be here in Wild Sound Studios where we recorded El País Invisible and kind of reliving some of those memories now that it's been uh, nominated. So really glad to be here and thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely. It's beautiful to be in the studio. It's a, it's a, it has a great feel in here. It's a beautiful space. Um, so can you just start just by introducing yourself to us? You know, and I'm, I'm curious because we're talking about this project, El País Invisible. Um, you were born and raised in Puerto Rico, right? Yep, that's right. I grew up in the West Coast. Uh, the town is called Mayagüez, and my family and I lived in Puerto Rico until 1999, so I was 15 when we moved to the mainland United States. Okay, wow. Well. And uh, I'll kind of never forget the move because we moved to Columbia, Missouri, and going from uh, living in a small college town community, uh, similarly sized to Columbia, Missouri, but that was in an island in the middle of the planet to fly over country to a similarly sized community that was also a college town uh, where there was just like no traffic and everything was flat and you felt like you could see it to the end of the earth. It was uh, quite a change, but uh, absolutely I spent uh, a really wonderful 15 years on the island and that experience has definitely informed how I think about everything that I do now as an adult. Mm. Yeah. When did music come into your life? Was music something that was a part of your family? Were you uh, playing music in Puerto Rico or was that something that happened later? Like, can you talk about how, how did you start this journey towards being a musician? Well, um, I don't actually remember the age in terms of starting uh, to study music. My parents... Uh, were, I suppose, like a lot of other parents, folks who were interested in keeping us active as kids. I uh, did uh, some basketball primarily. Mm. And ironically enough, uh, one of the people that I played with um, was so, so successful that ended up playing with the Minnesota Timberwolves for a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, J.J. Barea. Um, hey, wow, and, you played basketball with J.J. Barea? Yes, I was terrible. He was great. That's um, amazing. And uh, he uh, um, he was just uh, kind of uh, always a standout athlete and a very competitive person. Um, Are y'all from the same town? Yes, uh, we're from the same hometown. and, and uh, But I think that, uh, you know, my time in sports uh, was okay and it was nice to be active but i didn't perform very well uh and in music it wasn't actually too dissimilar i was put into music lessons and i did the little uh oral skills test and rhythm test uh, and something that i will say that i think i've always really appreciated about puerto rico and even more now 
Um, music is taught in these free public school programs. Wow. And there are these sort of uh, regional programs. So each school is kind of important because it absorbs students from different communities. And generally speaking, you had enough resources to start, like instrument and reeds. Uh, and so... You really didn't have to be wealthy and, and like in sports, uh, also in music, I feel like a, a good reason or a good part of the reason why some folks make it all the way through is just because it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a thing of privilege. Yeah. And so I did uh, very poorly when I started in lessons. I knew there were some aptitude there, but because I was doing sports, I was just not really spending a whole lot of time practicing. And um, that ended up bumping up into moving to the U.S. So, um, you know, I think that as far as exposure to music, um, a lot of that experience was informed by what my parents listened to. And I was really exposed to, uh, I guess, what I would describe as Afro-Puerto Rican music. Mm. Um, during a time when Puerto Rico was sort of opened up to the U.S. by the creation of the Commonwealth. So you see a lot of these Latin American artists ending up uh, in the East Coast doing what they do best. You know, at that time, that music was really well received and these were well-traveled groups. But in reality, this was music that was kind of before my time. It was more my parents' music. Can you talk to us about that what do you, when you say during the time of the Commonwealth? Because one of the things we're going to get into is like, you know, the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. So what is that? What is the Commonwealth? Well, you know, initially, uh, Puerto Rico was just... Uh, a colony of the United States um, in a more traditional way, but there was a huge push for independence, and that was sort of supplanted by uh, Commonwealth status. So some of the privileges are kind of awarded similar to being a state. Others are um, not awarded. Uh, mm. So, for example, if we're talking about politics, uh, people who live on the island cannot vote for the president of the United States. And they make it sort of uh, very uh, uh, ironical, so they can vote in the primaries. And it, it's sort of uh, um, this very artificial uh, way of keeping people engaged and involved. Um, but one of the things that um, I suppose was uh, changed was that now people who lived on the island could then start traveling uh, to the mainland. Mm. And when you are born in Puerto Rico, you are born a citizen of the United States. Mm. So that created a huge wave of people who started moving. Uh, I think it seems like to me like uh, the East Coast primarily, this was sort of in the 50s and 60s. So uh, the music kind of come, the music that I was exposed to kind of comes from that time. These sort of musical groups that were playing um music that sort of melted was what was going on in latin america obviously very influenced by cuban music and, mm. and obviously all the african heritage that was brought over in terms of like the kinds of percussion instruments that uh, are used and the kinds of rhythms that are built into and baked into that music and so yeah that always kind of stuck with me but then you know there's an abrupt interruption uh, by moving to the u.s and i would say more of a defining moment for me was after not having played for a while um, and living in Missouri, we uh, started in a school where I had to use the school bus. And that was really problematic for me. The bullying was really intense. Mm. And at the time, my ability to keep up with the English language and sort of articulate my thoughts in real time was still difficult. You know, I understood a new English, but uh, I just wasn't really capable of using it and so to beat off a bully on the school bus absolutely yeah and so um the saxophone which is the instrument that i owned um and uh cross country actually became my way of forcing my parents to pick me up from school to avoid using the school bus wow so then i was just uh staying after school to practice and to go to practice 
And, you know, those two things have stayed with me today because, one, uh, cross country was probably the first team experience that I had that was really positive in the U.S., so it's really informed the way I think about exercising. I'm still a daily runner, 50 miles a week, more or less. Oh, and, wow. Um, hold up, hold up. Did you say 15 or 50? Five zero. Okay. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think it was really informed by the fact that it was just a great team experience. It was a very supportive unit. It was a very selfless way of going to practice. There's something mm. very unique about that team. And... Um, so, you know, I haven't had formal lessons in a long time, but I'm staying and practicing. There's a person, his name is John Patterson, who was just about to retire. He was the director of bands at that school, Hickman High School in Columbia, Missouri. Mm. And he basically was like, hey, I want you to audition for the band. Um, and one thing led to another. He became my private teacher and just provided a lot of structure. I think he recognized that I was kind of a very motivated and methodical person and just sort of fed into that. Um, I had, I think, some scholarships um, and offers to go to, I think it was the University of Wisconsin, maybe Purdue and Northeastern in engineering, which is what most of my family has done. Um, the, my family has like a billion PhDs and okay. everything in sciences and engineering and accountancy. Um, but John was like, I think you could do music and I think you could get a scholarship, which of course, um, uh, really scared my parents. I was just thinking your parents are like, John, huh, derp, derp, no music. Yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Probably one of the uh, most intense, uh, discussions that I had with my dad was in the basement after I told him that I wanted to do music. But sure enough, I went out and I got a few offers and I ended up in a little school in Northeast Missouri. Um, but I think the defining moment there for me was just like, I was trying to find some isolation at school and uh, practicing and joining the team, helped that out. And then uh, serendipitously meeting someone who literally changed my life yeah and i'm proud to say you know john is retired and and he's at an advanced stage but i still go back to see him and i have breakfast with him i feel a lot of gratitude for someone who uh, took the time to uh, make me feel like i could do something and be successful at it yeah you know those are the seeds that are planted that help shape uh those experiences um hell yeah but that's how that kind of came together and then you know i started going through the graduate school process in music and you know the way i've revisited what's kind of led into this project was just sort of realizing that there perhaps was a ceiling for me in graduate school in terms of the music that i was learning and doing and um but after i finished my doctorate uh i had started to perform fairly regularly and that was going okay but uh puerto rico was struck by two hurricanes consecutive, Irma and Maria. Yeah, could you remind us what what years was that? Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, and so then I start to think back a lot about my experience in the island and and those perspectives and what I had brought with me. So, for example, when I introduce myself and and sort of public facing things that you engage with. Uh, Jose Antonio Salas Caban. I have first, middle, and two last names. Mm -hmm. A ways to kind of reclaim and force people to think about where I'm from because we use two family names mm -hmm. um, on the island, starting with that. And then also, um, it really brought me back to when I was there in Hurricane George. I think it was in 1996. Went through the island I specifically remember when the mainland U.S. media stopped covering the issue, even though we still had great needs. Like, for example, in my family, I felt like we were a privileged, lower, middle-class family. We were without power and water for about four months. Wow. But it took years for some people to get roofs back on their wow. homes. And... Um, I remember that the coverage stopped, uh, obviously, much before that. And I remember the moment uh, 
uh, when that happened because uh, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were fighting for the home run championship mm. uh, that year, and it felt like we were just completely forgotten and kind of invisibilized, right? It was just like our story was sort of erased. And I felt like the same thing was happening, you know, like everyone was covering the devastation and Puerto Rico was underwater in 2017, but then that just kind of started to fade away. And I talked to some of the trio members and I said, I can absolutely spend no more time playing music to entertain uh, wealthy folks or, you know, these sort of like traditional ticketed events or playing the stuff that I was learning in school. I want to go out and start to help fundraise, and they were agreeable to it, so we did a little tour at a tribute to Puerto Rico, and um, that uh, kind of helped uh, set me on a new path where I was thinking about music as a vehicle to do some advocacy and raise uh, awareness about social issues that I cared about. For example, the albums, uh, even though this one, El País Invisible, is getting some recognition, the first one I'm really proud of, um, and I think it's very emblematic of how we do our work. It's called Centennial, right? and it was kind of a repudiation of the fact that we're celebrating the women's suffrage movement when, in fact, uh, black American women uh, had to wait way longer to get the right to vote. Right. And then the other thing, the album is sort of a way of saying, like, these problems have really not improved that much in the last century. Yeah. And um, not only is the project on that subject that sort of, uh, when I say emblematic of the way we do the work, um, we commission composers that are willing to write music about the subject. Um, but uh, also Catherine Lawson, Carrie Lawson, who writes the liner notes, um, I think she has a two PhDs in like library sciences and musicology. I forgot what the second one is in, but Catherine is someone I met when I was in school at the University of Iowa. Um, she researches and writes these notes, and I always encourage people to go read them because they are great essays. Mm. You know, and I, one of the first sentences in Centennial is like, this is not a time to celebrate. Yeah, I, re I read some of the pieces last night, and I, I, uh, I really appreciated that, you know? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and then El País Invisible is a single that's part of an album that we recorded with Miguel. Could you say for our listeners, who is Miguel? Uh, Miguel Senon is uh, a saxophonist uh, from Puerto Rico who has been awarded many Grammy nominations. Um, the MacArthur Genius Grant, uh, the Guggenheim Grant. Um, so he's uh, a great uh, saxophonist and a great composer. Um, and the reason why I've been interested in him, of course, it's, I think, the the most obvious thing. A saxophonist who comes from Puerto Rico is a, a model for a person like me who's thinking about uh, being in the field. Uh, but, you know, if you're educated in music and you listen to his music and you follow what he has to say about it, I think he is a unique ambassador for incorporating Puerto Rican musical history into his playing. Mm -hmm. His improvising is so rhythmical, and I feel like um, he doesn't get enough credit for taking Puerto Rican music forward into the future. I was immediately kind of attracted to that thoughtfulness in his playing and his thinking and his composing. Um, 
And so it, it just ended up that I'm a classically trained saxophonist, so we play the boring stuff, right? Mm. We go to school, and it's a lot of white male composers and mm. uh, a lot of transcriptions and a lot of new music. But, you know, I was in this phase now where I was thinking about how to better represent these social issues. Um, a friend of mine, Dana Boer, uh, who is in the Navy Premier Band in D.C., uh, I was just talking to him, and they organize a saxophone symposium. Um, and one of my favorite ones, just because they have a a free concert series for a college level quartet. So there's no like entry requirement and all these college students can come in. Cool. But he was like, hey, our guest is going to be Miguel. And I was like, wow, that's so exciting. So I worked up the nerve to email him and say, hey, can we do something to raise a little bit of awareness about what's going on in Puerto Rico? And honestly, to my pleasant surprise, somebody who's so busy and uh, so accomplished, he said, yeah, for sure. Hell yeah. You know, he remembered and he was giving a master class. And after the master class, we played a version of a song called Preciosa, which is a poem that's really well celebrated in Puerto Rico by composer Rafael Hernandez. Um, it's sort of like Puerto Rico's second national anthem, if okay. you want to say. They're beautiful. And, uh, and then um, I had it in my mind that... I needed to find a way to continue this work. So my idea was to start commissioning Puerto Rican composers to start writing about the Puerto Rican experience, whether it's you living on the island or you being in the diaspora uh, because of hurricanes and having to move over or you're just first, second generation Puerto Rican that's living here and start to sort of portray those stories. Um and then the other idea was, which actually was influenced by Miguel, he has a project called Caravana Cultural, which uh, basically he, he brings uh, these uh, composers and this music to Puerto Rico to kind of expose folks to the kind of things that he's doing and other great jazz musicians. Um, and it's this wonderful kind of cultural exchange that he does. And, you know, my idea was um, to start raising money to commission composers, uh, raise awareness about Puerto Rico and better understanding about Puerto Rico in the mainland, but then also to start giving free concerts in different communities um, across the island and documenting some of those experiences so that people could kind of get a collage picture of like, what is it like to be on the island? What is it like to be Puerto Rican here? Because, you know, one of the stats that came up, I think, after 2017 was like 50% of mainland residents don't know that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if it was 50. Yeah, you know? so, yeah. so fundamentally, um, whether you think about it from the point of view of Puerto Rico um, or otherwise, people just don't understand how large the United States empire is. Right. And That's even a, a phrase that most Americans don't think of the American empire, you know, we don't talk about ourselves in that way or the, the mainstream media, the mainstream culture does a lot to hide the fact that we are an empire and Puerto Rico is, is such an obvious example, you know, but like you said, most um, Americans don't even know that we have colonies, you know? Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, I had, uh, read how to hide an empire by mm. Daniel Immervar. Mm and listen to some of his interviews. I think he teaches at Northwestern. Okay. Um, and I had also read uh, Empire of Borders by Todd Miller, mm. uh, where he talks about how the United States empire doesn't really start at the natural physical borders. It actually starts like in the Guatemala-Mexico border, and it starts in Puerto Rico. And, and he sort of traces the money uh, for how border is funded across the world and where U.S. Uh, border funding uh, exists, you know, all around the world. It's a very interesting book. Mm. Um, and I reached out to both of them. I said, you know, I want to do this project and uh, would like to see if you can make some contributions. And uh, sure enough, they were agreeable to it. They wrote short essays that Catherine's sort of incorporating. So when the full album comes out, 
Um, there will be a little bit about that. Wow. So the whole album is going to have this liner notes co uh, companion with it that has this background information and context. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, and so I think that's uh, an important way to introduce uh, Puerto Rico to uh, listeners in the community. And I feel very strongly that sometimes, uh, which informs a lot of the work that I do now in advocacy, um, it's important to deliver things with experiences. You know, so when you come to a concert, you're still enjoying some music and you're getting entertained, but you also get to think about something um, and something a little bit more deeply and you get introduced to it. And so, you know, Miguel sort of represents that first effort. Um, the next one, Pedacito de Tierra, is even more of a combination of my work because Angelica Negron uh, is someone who's New York based and has had a lot of success, writes very different music, but Pedacito de Tierra will involve some community engagement where the idea is to set up these little workshops where uh, Puerto Rican residents of Minnesota, especially the Twin Cities, could come in, talk about their experiences, but then she'll teach them how to write mini compositions that then she'll compile and make a composition out of it for the trio to perform and record. Amazing. And, uh, but you know, that's, that's kind of the catch that with Miguel... Um, I went to New Music USA, uh, wrote a grant that allowed me to fund the commission for him to write El País Invisible. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get the McKnight Fellowship here, and that included some resources to record. Um, and so with that, was able to put together this project, and then we were able to get hired to perform a few performances. Unfortunately, I've never been able to get a gig here locally in Minneapolis. I would love to perform that here. But yeah. um, with Angelica, it's going kind of a step uh, deeper. And I think that'll be a re very interesting. We also applied for the American Composers Forum um, residency program. And that's how uh, Angelica will have the funding to come and be here. And then, you know, my job is to find funding for the, for the commission. But I think that'll be great because then, like, the actual community members will kind of have a say in what's composed. Yeah. And um, that, I think, is, a, you know, again, it's sort of a creative way of raising an issue. Yeah, definitely. You know, and so I'm always thinking very critically about how to project these ideas uh, in creative ways. And, and multidisciplinary projects are just kind of a passion of mine. I always think about... You know, in in the woke world, intersectionality unfortunately has been watered down yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. So, you know, I try to be careful about calling it interdisciplinary because these are really talented people who care about the subject. And that's, I, I think, probably what uh, the other thing that's very helpful um, is that I have been very fortunate. And also when you try to do work that's meaningful, it's attractive to folks who like to do the work well and like to work hard and care about the subject matter. So then the quality of the work is super high. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, I feel a lot of gratitude, but that's kind of the trajectory there. And when will, so right now there's a, a piece of music that I heard from El País Invisible that's like 12, 13 minutes long. Mm -hmm. That's just like a really moving piece. And I'm like instrumental music i don't know how you would even classify it you know as but um it was so moving for me to hear because i, I listen to a lot of music with lyrics you know i listen to a lot of hip-hop and I, I listen to some other stuff but to hear this arrangement and it's like it's it feels like jazz it feels like classical it feels it's it, it was cool I, I i sent it to my wife and she played it today and like I, i've really enjoyed sharing it. and it's, it's like woken something up in me to want to hear more sounds but it was moving you know like and i knew what the project was about the prompt of it coming into it you know and it, it really stirred me i say all that to say that piece is out now and that's what's been grammy nominated when does the whole project drop yeah so i think i can wrap both both of those things up into kind of one answer which is that el país invisible is written from a motive that's pulled from puerto rico's national anthem mm-hmm and when we worked with Miguel, 
uh, another reason why I reached out to him. He's really kind of the perfect candidate to start this project. He had already written music for him and other classical musicians. So he had a very clear understanding of like how to write music um, as sort of f for folks who are kind of across the river. So it's somewhere in that middle and it's just great. Um, and uh, the full album should come out in the spring of 2023. And that's kind of special in itself because um, it's music from different parts of, of the Americas and different uh, Latin American composers. Um, but several of them are by uh, Puerto Rican composers, uh, sort of of old. And so it's kind of representative of my childhood in a mm. way, listening to the music that my parents and grandparents uh mm uh they they had on hand um but it, it's very similar it's like latin american music um and it's somewhere in the middle you'll get to hear literally the way that we work which was we set up the transcriptions and the arrangements we would work through them we talked to miguel he'd suggest improvising in certain sections we would then broaden them out or just like pause them give you know give him the time to do that um and it's just wonderful because he he does a phenomenal job, and uh, but the title is going to be "Romance al Campesino Porteño," and "Romance al Campesino" is uh, a work by a Puerto Rican composer from my hometown, who kind of ironically comes from a family that was both in politics and music mm. in Mayagüez, uh, Roberto Cole. Roberto Cole, one of his relatives is Henry Cole, who's the drummer in Miguel's quartet. Oh, wow. Um, so that's completely coincidental. But um, Porteño is part of the title of a work we arranged for this album, Estaciones Porteñas. And it's by Astor Piazzolla, who was kind of well known uh, a few decades ago for writing what's often referred to as the new tango. Um, porteño is sort of a word to refer to someone who lives by a port or a coast. Right, right, um, right. So I kind of combined the two titles just because people in Puerto Rico are also coastal folks. But uh, even in the cover, you, uh, we basically did a Google Maps shot of um, in Puerto Rico's capital and in that metro area. There are a lot of streets that are named uh, um, after capitals in other Latin American countries. So the cover is sort of like... Uh, the order of tracks going from street to street, Dope. and so the, the the dots are then connected, um, and it's personally significant because um, my grandmother lived in a neighborhood that was called the Americas. So like she lived on Kingston Street. Wow. You know, and so I wanted to do a little clever play on on that, uh, but I'm excited for people to hear that because it's gonna be going kind of back in time. And uh, on a new take on on what this you know music that has lived for a while, uh, with a new take on that music and um, El País Invisible getting a nomination is important to me because that means that at least a few more people are thinking about that subject while they're engaging with the music. And whether they know it or not, they're listening to music that's extrapolated from Puerto Rican's national anthem, which happens to be based on a poem and a melody that was written for the two years out of Puerto Rico's very long history where Puerto Rico was independent. Um, and so it's sort of meant to celebrate. What two years were those? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's like uh, just before the ten turn of the... Uh, century, so like 1898. Okay, yeah. Uh, whereabouts? Um, right in that time when the Spanish, I imagine, were leaving, and then the U.S. swept in. Yeah. So yeah. end of Spanish-American conflict. Um, I think Puerto Rico has been a colony for more years than any other country in the world. Wow. Uh, Puerto Rico has been some other country's property for yeah. for centuries, and that's kind of you know why Invisible works so well. The Invisible Nation. Mm -hmm. You know, living in this sort of political limbo and the people and the culture and the things that stem from it sort of uh, getting buried. And that awareness, you know, that those hurricanes and, and thinking about how to bring that awareness also got me thinking about 
my own experiences and how to protect them. You know, the things that I inherited from family and cultural traditions um, in a way that <clears throat> they didn't necessarily get whitewashed by living here in the mainland for so many years. And a big part of the reason why I started to revisit food is just kind of a big, big part of my experience as a kid, having great food, you know, a family that had a lot of good cooks. Um, I was looking through the gallery online that, um, of the dishes that you have. You know, can, can you, let's talk about that a little bit because I was going to save it for the end, but it makes sense here. Um, you were just introducing it to us, but would you consider yourself a chef? No, um, but um, I I like to cook, and I love yeah. to cook. I think the reason why um, it's kind of a natural fit is I like doing a lot of methodical work and a lot mm -hmm. of independent work, and so it just kind of feeds into that energy. Um, but the gallery, I think, is important because um, one of the best cooks in my family... Uh, who's photographed on the website. Um, she passed away just before those hurricanes went through, and she's someone whose food I had and therefore whose house I was in for quite a few years of my childhood, especially when we were playing basketball. We'd stop and stay there and visit. Mm. Um, and I was not able to go to the funeral, and that really frustrated me. Yeah. Um, I felt very disconnected not being able to travel because of uh, all the devastation. It was just difficult to get there. Um, and we were doing all the photography for the website. And so I asked the photographer and we talked about it. I would make food for him when he'd come over, you know, and, um, and we decided to photograph the food. But that was definitely... Um, Although I love to cook and I try to do it very well, I, I don't, I don't have formal training. I've taken a few classes over the years. Um, that was a way for me to revisit those memories yeah. in sort of a cathartic way. Yeah. Um, so there were times where we would shooting saxophones or whatever, and then I was literally using every dish in the house, making like fifteen dishes. And Peter Yankowski is the photographer's name; is phenomenal. He. Uh, we just take the time and stay extra, and, and then we made a little project out of it for a while. Um, you know, it's no substitute uh, for being able to be present and join my family. But that's one of the things about Empire is that um, it prevents you from being able to make some of those choices. You know, even though it was like uh, flooding or whatever, you know, it was a natural disaster. Um, it exacerbates and it highlights the fact that Puerto Rico is living with this terrible infrastructure. That's mm -hmm. the result of uh, being co a colony and mm -hmm. having uh, no sovereignty, you know, economic sovereignty and in other ways. And so it impacts you in a very personal and individual way. So, you know, it was my way of kind of reaching out to her and remembering her and kind That's of recognizing beautiful. that... Yeah, she just, uh, she really touched me, and, and those experiences were some of the most positive experiences that I had when I was on the island. That's beautiful. It's powerful. You know, food is such a such a powerful thing, you know, and, you, and when you invited me for a meal, I really appreciated that. We haven't got to enjoy it yet, but I'm sure we will. Can you let our listeners know where they can catch up with your work, with your music and your advocacy? Yes, um, ourstreetsmpls.org. Go to the Advocacy tab, and the website is joseantonio-sajascaban.com, um, and that's where you can engage with the stuff. Great, and we'll put links. I want to say thank you, Jose Antonio Zayas Caban, for coming on the show, for doing the work that you're doing. I'm excited to hear the rest of the project that's coming out in the spring, and we'll make sure we'll drop it for listeners in the show notes. Money, power, land, solidarity.